Now, let's take a look at the process of conducting an actual survey. Before conducting any survey, you should first try to find out as much information as you possibly can about the site you'll be surveying. The radar operator will need to know some of the following information. Taxonomic family, geologic setting, terrain conditions, wooded, cropland, urban, size of the area to be covered, location of the site. The use of the terms you and your in the remainder of the GPR segment of this video refers to the radar operator. This section is included to give the viewer an overview of what is involved in conducting the survey. So first we need to estimate target characteristics. Here are some questions to answer. How deep is the object that we want to see? What are the overall dimensions of the objects? What are the other subsurface materials surrounding the objects? How well are the boundaries of the objects defined? To illustrate the importance of knowing as much as possible about your target, there is a very general guideline that can sometimes be applied if you're looking for metal, cylindrical objects. The object should have about one inch of diameter for every foot of depth. So you should be able to find a three inch metal pipe to a depth of about three feet. Beyond that, it would be increasingly difficult to see. If a pipe is at a five foot depth, it would need to be no less than about five inches in diameter to be visible. Remember, this is only for metal pipe. Other materials with different dielectric constants would have different requirements. And of course, the surrounding subsurface materials will also affect your data. The possible depths of your survey will decrease as the electrical conductivity of the subsurface material increases, the water content increases, the clay content increases, scattering of the radar signal increases, and conductive contaminants increase. Once your target characteristics are identified, you can select an antenna. The two main factors to consider are first, what is the maximum target depth? And second, what is the size of the target? This difference in penetration depths and resolution makes selecting the proper size antenna crucial to the success of a GPR survey. The next step before surveying is to estimate the two-way slowness of the radar signal in the area we are working. At this point, the SIR-2 can be set up. If you'll be powering your system with a vehicle, as you see here, be sure the engine is running before you power the system up. Also, be sure you turn the system off before you turn the engine off. When the equipment is hooked up and the parameters set, conduct some preliminary test lines. The survey area should be gridded with flags, stakes, or paint placed at measured distances. The longer the test lines, the better. When surveying the ground, a minimum test line is about 30 feet. With a handheld antenna, make the line as long as is practical. It's also a good idea to do several test lines before doing the actual survey. When you're ready to do a test line, press the marker switch at the antenna to start data collection. Then double click the marker switch when you start walking. If you're not using a survey wheel, try to pull the antenna at a constant speed, slightly slower than a normal walking pace. Press the marker switch once each time the center of the antenna passes the marked distances along the line. When you reach the end of the line, Hold the marker switch down for two seconds to stop the data scrolling and close the file. If you know the location of some buried objects in the area, this is the time to use these targets to check the system settings and make necessary adjustments. Once you are satisfied with the settings, you can conduct the survey. You should try to not change the settings once you have started the survey. Again, Remember to pull the antenna at a constant speed. Use the strain relief clips on the control cable and don't pull the antenna if the cable gets stuck. Never let the cable run underneath the antenna during the survey. It's best to have the cable drag behind the antenna as you pull it. Finally, be sure to keep a detailed log of the survey and keep accurate notes of the files saved on your hard disk. 
You now know how to set up your SIR system too, and how to conduct a survey. You're armed with a tremendous tool, and a key to your success is how well you interpret the data you acquire. In earlier sections of this training video, we covered the principles of subsurface interface radar. We touched on how the electrical characteristics of the soil affect wave propagation, types of soil where radar will be most useful, and how reflections from various interfaces occur. This will all be helpful in data interpretation. Let's now look at a basic ground penetrating radar concept. Here the radar pulses enter the subsurface and reflect off interfaces or targets. On the records we receive, the vertical axis is depth and time. Later we'll learn how to convert this to feet or meters. Our horizontal axis is distance traveled by the antenna across the area of investigation. When interpreting radar data, you'll be considering three characteristics of the data. One, how does the strength of the reflections vary? Two, do the targets or zones of interest have unique reflection patterns? Three, what is the vertical and lateral extent of the unique patterns or reflections of interest? What determines reflection strength? Basically, the reflection strength is determined by the change in electrical characteristics between two layers, or the difference between a target and its surrounding medium. As we showed in the beginning, if water saturation occurs gradually with depth, you will not see a response from the water table. But if the change is abrupt, a sharp response will occur. This is also true in regard to changes in electrical characteristics. For example, a change from dry sand to loam represents a significant change in dielectric properties from 4 for sand to 19 for loam. Let's review the following equation, where E sub 1 equals the dielectric of the first layer E sub 2 equals the dielectric of the second layer, R equals the reflection coefficient. For our example of dry sand to loam, the equation looks like this. The reflection coefficient ranges from 0 to 1 and 0 to minus 1. The closer to 1 or minus 1, the stronger the reflection, and the closer to 0, the weaker the reflection. A reflection coefficient of 0 to plus or minus 0.2 is a weak response. Plus or minus 0.2 to plus or minus 0.35 is a medium response, and greater than plus or minus 0.35 is a strong response. Our example of dry sand to loam will produce a relatively strong signal response. Now, let's look at responses from targets. Let's consider a 6-inch diameter PVC pipe, air-filled, buried 4 feet deep in saturated sand. The dielectric of saturated sand is approximately 30, and the dielectric of air-filled PVC pipe is approximately 1. The equation now looks like this. Again, we receive a strong signal from this target because of the significant contrast in dielectric values. Here is a tougher situation. Let's examine what happens when a concrete pad is buried in dry sand. The dielectric of dry sand is approximately four, and the concrete pad is approximately six. In this scenario, the concrete pad would be virtually invisible. Understanding the dielectric values of the materials you're working with prior to starting a survey can help plan what to expect from your data. Let us divide interpretation into three general objectives and discuss what characteristic reflection patterns may exist. First, looking for man-made targets. Second, mapping the structure of the subsurface. Third, non-destructive evaluation of concrete structures. A cylindrical target, such as a pipe, tank, or drum, will produce a distinct response due to its shape. Thus, this is the first characteristic that we look for in the data. 
the strength of the hyperbolic reflection will depend upon the material as discussed above. Water-filled PVC or metal targets produce strong reflections. Air-filled PVC and concrete targets typically produce weaker reflections. When looking for utilities, you should expect to see the hyperbolic on several lines. In addition to observing the target reflections, you can also look for secondary features, in particular trenching. This often shows as a disruption in the horizontal subsurface layering. When interpreting natural stratigraphy, the continuity of reflections and their signal strength is an important consideration. For example, a wet clay underlying a dry sand will provide a large dielectric contrast and a strong reflection. In contrast, a silt overlying granite bedrock would not produce a strong reflection. If the pattern of continuity of reflectors change, we can interpret that as indicative of subsurface change. The water table will sometimes show as a strong reflection cutting across sediment reflections. While in fine-grained materials, it will often not be observed. Air-filled voids in bedrocks have a strong dielectric contrast and thus produce strong reflections. Non-destructive evaluations of concrete structures normally focuses on one or more of the following objectives. Location of reinforcing, determining thickness, and identifying various defects. Metal reinforcing bars show in the data as high amplitude, small hyperbolas in a regular pattern. Voids at the base of concrete, if large enough, will show as high amplitude reflections due to the dielectric contrast. The reflections from the bottom of concrete can vary in strength depending on the underlying material. The reflections continuity will vary depending upon the amount of metal reinforcing above. Once you have identified your targets or layers of interest, you'll want to determine their depth. Determining depth is an important capability of GPR. Depth is the vertical axis of the profile view. It is labeled in terms of time and can be converted to depth. There are four methods to estimate depth. The method used will depend on the required precision for depth measurements available equipment, and site conditions. Method one, use assumed radar velocities from tables in your manual. Method two, locate object of known depth. Method three, geometric scaling. Method four, simple CDP. Methods one and two are the simplest and most commonly used methods. We'll discuss these two methods. Method one, estimating velocity from the dielectric constant requires that you know something about the materials that you're working with. If you can determine the dielectric of the materials, you can use this equation. Method two, locate objects of known depth. Caution must be exercised because the velocity calculated is only an average to the target depth at that location. Lateral changes in moisture content of soil and rock composition will affect radar velocities. First, acquire a line of GPR data perpendicular to the long axis of a target of known depth, such as a tank or a pipe. Second, determine the travel time to the target from the GPR data. Third, Estimate the velocity of the subsurface material using velocity equals travel time over depth. Fourth, the depth of unknown targets can now be estimated using depth equals travel time over velocity. You now understand how certain targets will be presented in your radar data, why reflection strengths vary, and how certain targets or interfaces can appear invisible to GPR. And finally, how to determine depth to a target or interface. Proceed cautiously. Never overinterpret your data. An anomaly is only an anomaly and becomes an identified feature only after proper ground truthing. 
each situation you encounter will be slightly different. By now, you can see that used properly, the SIR System 2 is an extremely versatile and easy to use tool. Even though you now have all the basic information you need to conduct your own surveys, you'll find that every survey will become a learning experience. And the more you use your SIR 2, the more familiar you'll become with its wide-ranging potential for gathering invaluable data. Use it as much as you can and experiment with different settings in different environments. The aggregate stability test is a method to determine